we're still braving the wilderness, and this is our last stop. So for those of you who are just joining us, um, the, the title of our series is Sovereign Belonging. It's all about belonging, but that sovereignty, that understanding of who I am as an authentic being is a key part of that belonging. And the book that we're using, that, that we base this series and also the class on Thursday nights is by Brene Brown called Braving the Wilderness. So uh, I want to revisit a little bit of where we've been and what we've learned and then go into this final stage, which is strong back, soft front, wild heart. So where have we been on the brave journey? Well, I can't name it all, but I can give you some highlights and reminders for those of you who've been with us. So one of the things that we learned is that belonging is not so much what we've often thought of it to be. Belonging is not so much about fitting in as it is about this quest for authenticity, understanding of who we are, and then we really find how we belong to God, how we belong to the truest part of ourselves, how we belong to our own heart and soul, how we belong to the human family, how we belong to all of life. So it is through this quest that we really come to that true belonging not a fitting in. So fitting in, it's really asks us to change who we are. And true belonging asks us to be who we truly are. So it's quite a difference, isn't it? We often talk about transformation on the spiritual path. But what we're really talking about is being ourselves. <laughs> Learning who we really are. Peeling off the layers of what is not me. So we can reveal what is truly me. And so that's been a part of re -under or, or maybe recasting the idea of belonging that many of us have worked with. We also learned on this journey to move closer to people that we have differences with, that we just see differently or understand differently or have different perspectives and different backgrounds. And so when, or even dislike, <laughs> or even have rail against, you know, so we have some energy against. And, and Brene Brown encourages us to see that when we move in closer, <laughs> it's harder to have those feelings about people. It's harder to have those feelings of resistance or even hatred if we're moving in close. And so when we move in close, when we cross those divisions, when we invite dialogue with people of different perspectives or different backgrounds, we find about all of our commonalities, don't we? When we come into those places, that's when we learn, oh, we've all kind of got the same needs. We all have the same desires. You know, we're in this human family. We all want love and compassion and kindness and peace and all those things. And so when we see one another from that perspective, then we lose some of this otherness, this divisiveness. We remember, too, that people are essentially good at their base, at their essence. You know, this is a key unity principle, isn't it? It's our second unity principle that there is an innate goodness in us, that we're born, we believe, in unity of original blessing or original virtue. We don't buy into this idea of original sin. We, when you see a, a child, you, 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 you know, a baby who's just come into the world, you know that <laughs> that has to be original blessing, right? That otherworldliness, that, that tenderness, that beauty. And so... It's that understanding that we are born of this original blessing that then comes through all of our interactions and all of our understandings. That when we treat one another and treat ourselves from that place of innate divinity, then there's a whole different way of being in the world. But it's tough work, isn't it? It's probably that one of the most challenging practices is to really practice the second principle of innate divinity, to see the Christ or the divine in all including ourselves. Because when we make mistakes and when you know things happen around us that aren't to our liking, it's a little bit harder for us. But we keep doing the work and we can call upon guides like Gandhi who said, if you don't find God in the first person you meet, it's a waste of time to look any further. And of course what he's saying is align yourself with your own innate divinity, your own understanding of that, and then everybody will be seen as the divine. 
you won't pick and choose. Well, that one was tough. Let me move on, see if I can find somebody who's a little bit easier, who's really what we mean, compliant to my wishes, right? <laughs> if I get somebody who's a little bit more compliant to my ideas and beliefs and wishes, then it'll be a little bit easier for me to see the divinity in them. But the work is the work, and people are people, and we are all one, right? So that innate divinity is in all of us. And if it, maybe this perspective helps you a little bit differently. Mother Teresa said, every day I meet Jesus Christ in all of his distressing disguises. And so if we go out into the world knowing that that's a part of our day, you know, that, that my work today is to see, to behold, to honor, to treat each person as if they are the divine, as if they are the Christ or the, the Buddha or whatever it is that, that really appeals to you as this idea of, of the deified human, which is all of us, which is a part of what this journey is all about. So that's a key. The, the key of this second one about moving closer is really the work of our second unity principle, but principle. And it's also this basic understanding of human dignity, of the human family together. We also, on this journey so far, acknowledged the spread, the rampant spread of hui in our lives. That's the, that's the euphemism for BS, by the way. <laughs> and, and so we know that that's around, that it's, it seems to be growing, it seems to be spreading, if you will, around the world. We may be knee deep in it. And yet our work is then to discern, right? To discern that gray area between truth and lies and to call it out when we see it. To have the strength, that strong back that we're gonna get to in a minute, that the strength to speak the truth. To, to those places where we see that there's that slippery slope being created for us to have the courage to call it forth. And we've also recognized that the bond between people is unbreakable. That we cannot break that bond just as surely as we cannot break the connection that we have with God. That connection is always there, right? We just forget. And so it is too with the human family. And of course we extend that to all of life. We understand that that connection goes to the animals and the plants and the trees and, and all the rest of, of all that has a heartbeat, right? And beyond. And so that bond cannot be broken, even though it may look broken and it may feel broken at times, it is unbreakable. And it's important to remember that. And one of the ways we do that is by coming and showing up, coming together for collective moments of pain and collective moments of joy and sharing those, even with strangers. Maybe especially so with strangers because when strangers are present and we cry together and we hold hands and we hug or we express joy and we dance together and we sing together, there is a remembering, oh yes, we are part of the same family. We belong together, we are related. This bond cannot be broken and the differences that seems to, to work at breaking it are less important when we have those experiences of those moments that remind us of the truth. So this week, strong back, soft front, wild heart. The Zen priest, Joan Halifax, it was the one who came up with strong, well, as far as we know, that's who Brene Brown traces it to, <laughs> strong back, soft front. And she talks about how a lot of us walk around in the world with a shield protecting a weak spine. You know, a shield of defensiveness that protects this spine that isn't so strong, that isn't so willing or courageous to stand up when it needs to, to be flexible when it needs to. We need a spine that is both sturdy and flexible. So it's kind of uh, like, you know, if you think about chiropractic, if any of you are familiar, certainly, if, even if you don't go to a chiropractor, you know a little bit about it probably. And what does a chiropractor do but adjusts us when we're out of alignment, right? So when we get out of alignment, there might be discomfort, there might be pain, or there might be even things in our body that are being compromised that we're not aware of, nerves and organs that are, you know, getting undue pressure in different ways. And so when we go to a chiropractor and we get adjusted, we bring that spine back into alignment, it's allowed to be both strong and flexible again. 
And that's kind of how we want to then use that metaphor to walk through the world. You know, to be both sturdy but yet flexible. To be courageous, essentially. And when we have that strong spine then, when we have that fortitude that's built on the connection with spirit and the understanding of who we are, then we can have a wide open soft front. Because we know our spine's there, it's got us, right? And, it, and it's, it's aligned with spirit, so nothing can hurt us, nothing can harm us. We can allow then, with that openness, the difficulties and the pain and the challenges that are around in our world to seep in. Because we got it, right? We've got our own back, so to speak. That's that, that term is such a beautiful term. And let it remind you when you say, I got your back to one another, that what you're really saying is, I'm, I'm strong. I'm, I'm centered in God. My back is sturdy and flexible. I can handle this. And so when we can handle it, then we can be open. We can have that soft front, that willingness to allow the difficulties of the world to come in. Jen Hatmaker is one of the people that um, Brene talks about in her book. She's a pastor, a philanthropist, and a writer. And she's a, a pastor of a church that's very uh, conservative Christian. And she wrote very openly about her belief in inclusivity and LGBTQ rights. And many people that she served spoke out against that. And so she was in this very difficult place, right? The wilderness. That's the wilderness. When we're in those places where we break from the, the community that it appears we belong to, and we speak what feels like our truth that is based on these kinds of values of inclusivity and oneness, and we get pushback, especially in her position, it was a very difficult walk for her. It was a wild and woolly wilderness. And maybe you can relate to times in your lives when you've spoken up, or maybe you've got something right now, where you've spoken up, called out the truth, been willing to be the whistleblower when something isn't going on, going right, or doesn't feel right somewhere. And when we do that is when we step out into the wilderness. And that wilderness walk can feel lonely for a while. But Jen Hatmaker talks about how it turns out when you walk out into that desert feeling like you're all alone, you suddenly meet a bunch of other folks who have had the strength to follow that path too. And it's rich and it's fun to come into community with those authentic beings who are, have strong backs and soft fronts. And then the wild hearts dance together. <laughs> so in a way, it is this walk of authentic belonging and truth that has a leg of it in the wilderness that feels maybe very lonely. But it's actually that, that narrow pathway, that narrow gate that Jesus talked about that we walk through when we're on the spiritual journey. That when we have the, the courage and the strength to walk through the narrow gate, that we'll actually find on the other side a tribe of folks that act like that, that live like that, that are in that kind of spiritual alignment. And don't we all want to live from that place of full aliveness? of really living our core values and not making any apologies for who we are. Not making any compromises, not pretzeling ourselves to fit into little boxes that aren't ours. That's where we really find our tribes and ourselves and our truth. So Jen Hatmaker says that human approval is one of the most treasured idols and an offering we must lay at its hungry feet is keeping others comfortable. She talks about a whole society that is uncomfortable with uncomfortability. <laughs> and so we must be willing to lay that offering at the hungry feet and keep other, of keeping others comfortable. That's a big one, isn't it? Because we all want approval. There is, a, there is sort of that instinctual desire to have approval, and that approval means love, and approval means attention, and there's things at risk here. I remember realizing once uh, when I was working with my board at my former church and we were doing some prosperity work, and I had this big aha. I was like, 
oh, wow, I see where I'm holding myself back, therefore, you know, holding us back in some ways, as we all were kind of owning up to our stuff, where I see that um, I have this fear that if I allow myself to become wealthy and generous, I'm going to lose my friends. You know, that some of the friends and the people that I relate to that um, kind of have set up these dichotomies of the wealthy and those who are, have less, that there's this nobility of having less, right? Some of us may, may realize there's an unconscious, for you maybe too, I don't know, but there was an unconscious belief for me that there was a, if, if I got wealthy and generous, I would be moving myself into a different set of belonging. And I didn't know that I wanted to be with that set the way that I perceived it. But see, we can't let that be our guide because what is our guide is the truth of our abundance, right? It's the truth of our divinity. And so it was that stepping out into the wilderness that was holding me back. But once we step, there we are, right? <laughs> and then we're on that journey of aliveness and abundance or whatever it is that is a part of that topic of stepping out. So it's our joy that we kind of leave at bay if we allow ourselves to be kept small by this idea of making everyone comfortable around us. Instead, it is the spirit in us is, is really the true authority. The only, it's not approval, but the only alignment that we're really looking for. And the rest then lines up from there. The divine order happens from there. So finding those places where we hold ourselves back is key. So the second one, so that's the strong back. That's the finding that strength within us and being willing to step out. And the second one is the soft front. And this is where, when we're in soft front, we're in that place of vulnerability, right? <laughs> if you haven't watched Brene Brown's TED Talk on the power of vulnerability, I urge you to do so. It really unpacks this term and our uncomfortability around the idea of vulnerability and really helps us step in then to the true power of what it's about, what the open front is all about. So a friend of mine gave me some sign language, uh, some sign language that she had learned and then I asked Larry uh, for clarification. So it turns out in sign language, just like in spoken language, there are many different ways to express the same words. So here's a couple of the ones that I saw for vulnerability. My friend said, it's like this. Like, weak in the knees, right? And then I asked Larry, and he said, it's like this. Any of you relate to that, right? <laughs> Whoa, I put the guard up. <laughs> and then uh, my friend Darlene said, there's also one like this. And that's the one we're after. <laughs> so why we react, right? Why we think of vulnerability is, oh, because there are two reasons, actually. Two reasons why we armor ourselves up, Brene Brown says. One is that we've been taught that emotions are something not to be comfortable with and that we equate vulnerability with weakness. And so when we do that, we have to be willing to ask the question, am I willing to be fully seen and let go of control of the outcome? That's a tough one, isn't it? Anybody have a tough one with that? <laughs> Feel like that's a tough journey? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we armor ourselves because we haven't been comfortable with emotions. Maybe you were taught or learned somehow by osmosis in your family that emo the expression of emotions wasn't fully okay or full expression wasn't okay. And so that might be part of that hold back, right? And then this idea then that it's equated with weakness. So if you're sad, if you're expressing sadness, for example, it's equated with weakness. This was my part of my family teaching. And my father, I only saw him cry two times. And once was when his father died. And the other time, his favorite sister was um, making her transition. She had been diagnosed with melanoma, a form of cancer, and given six months to live. And she was the longest known survivor in the US with melanoma. She lived 15 years. And so that was a great you know, celebration for us. But of course, the time came when she was making her transition. Not of course, but in this case, uh, the time did come. 
And my father, I would watch him. My dad was a really um, optimistic guy. He was always a glass, uh, half, uh, glass full, half full. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Spirit, for filling that in. Um, and, and so it was unusual for me to see him be so withdrawn and like looking at the fire every night and just really kind of lost in his own world. And one night he and I were up late together and he started to cry. And, wow, that was a long time ago, and it's still really fresh for me. And um, he, he was apologizing as he was choking out his tears, and it, that he was embarrassed, and that he was being a coward. And, I, it, and it, it gets me so much, because it's like that message, oh, it's so heartbreaking, isn't it? And I said, Dad, you're... It would be, you would be more of a coward if you held it back. It takes bravery to express your emotions. And I have held on to that, and maybe it makes me emotional because it also because it was such a precious moment. Like, I got to see that. You know, nobody else was there. I got to have that connection with my dad when he had a moment of vulnerability. And so it is that walking through the world, you know, and being willing <laughs> to have the strength to be vulnerable. Because that's really what it's about. To be vulnerable is to be strong. And that's the soft run. The other way that Brene says that we armor ourselves up and create this sort of defensive shield and weaker spine usually is when we've had trauma around vulnerability when staying open has become a liability in some way because there's been violence or oppression. And so that's a, a tough row, isn't it? It's like you know, that sort of innate, it feels, it feels like, cell, like a cellular reaction because you don't feel safe. And yet she says when we want to open then and we want to do this work, then we need to ask the question, am I willing to create courageous spaces where I can be seen? And I, am I willing to create those courageous spaces in my life, those courageous space for myself where I, where I can be fully seen. So we start maybe small, you know, where we really trust our peeps and there we become more vulnerable. And then we begin to expand that circle. That might be one of the ways that we could do this, create courageous space for ourselves to be fully seen. So it may be baby steps. It often is for many of us to move into that place where we can be truly vulnerable. And so that's the soft front. And then there's the wild heart. She says, the quest here is to live from our wild hearts, not our weary hurts. And so when we live from our weary hurts, of course, is where we put all the shields up, right? But if we live from our wild hearts, we say, okay, game's on, God. You know, I am scared and excited. I am brave and afraid. I am tender and I am tough. You know, it's holding that kind of paradox, being willing to play full out, to engage in life fully, to stand up when we need to, to stand up for others who are less privileged than we are. To have that kind of strength is a wild heart. And not to diminish our own pain. This is a really important part of the wild heart. That because when we diminish our own pain and compare our whatever we think the levels of pain or hurt or difficulty are for others, we actually diminish our ability to be empathetic. So if you feel pain or hurt about something, that's real. And pain is pain. Hurt is hurt, right? So understanding that and allowing that and giving that spaciousness and, and kindness allows us then to be more empathetic with others. So we don't, with a wild heart, diminish our own pain. We also don't sacrifice our own joy. So if we're making a habit of giving and giving and giving to others to help them or to ease their pain, and we're doing that in a way that continues to sacrifice our own joy, there will be a point of no return or little return, right? Where that begins to erode. So it's also finding that beautiful kind of balance or that sweet spot, I'd like to say. Find that sweet spot 
where you are honoring the joy of your own life and your own desires and also of service. And notice, it, if the more attuned we are to spirit, the clearer that guidance comes. The more our bodies will also provide that wisdom to us. So the clearer and clearer we get, and the more befriended we get to the spirit in us, to the divine in us, the, the more that we can understand where that sweet spot is for us and, and recognize it more immediately and know more immediately, okay, so now I need to pull back a little bit from all the service I've been doing and I need to go take a walk in the woods or a hot bath or whatever it is that, that brings you that kind of joy that brings you back to the center. So it is that, that work that is also a part of the wild heart. And the wild heart is grateful too. Brene says that when we are grateful for what we have, we can understand the magnitude of what someone else has lost. Isn't that powerful? When we are grateful for what we have, when we really allow ourselves to engage in, in daily gratitude for our family, for our life, for our health, for our wealth, for the roof over our head and the food we you know, once you start with gratitude, it's just... Yeah, it's the, it's the gratitude tirade. <laughs> you know, it just grows and grows and grows and it lifts us, doesn't it? So when it lifts us in consciousness and we are really truly grateful for what we have, then in a wild heart, we don't wall off from pain. With a wild heart, then we can really understand when you've lost someone or something, the magnitude of that. We can also be in the magnitude of that because we understand how precious it is for the things that we have. So, lots to think about, isn't it? With a strong back and open front and a wild heart. I'd like to just visit kind of some key how-tos of where we've been in the whole series. And the, um, the first one is, and, and I've called this the seven keys to a brave new order. Basically, the seven keys to a brave new order of us and the world. You know, these are some keys of how we can operate in a world in this way with that strong back, that soft front, and that wild heart. This is how we can brave the wilderness. These are some of the key steps. So one of them is to rehumanize and divinize. divinize. I think I've made this word up. I'm not sure. <laughs> What do they call that? Poetic license? I'm going to call it. <laughs> so, um, so rehumanizing. Remember in this series we talked about that, that terrible process of dehumanizing. When we begin, because we come wired in with a sense of moral inclusion, that we are human beings, we all belong to the same family, and then there is a process sometimes we do of casting out somebody out of that circle of moral inclusion and we start this, actually there's a whole process of dehumanizing others by the power of language and imagery in which we then, okay, so now we're all in the moral circle, but it's those people that, that suddenly begin, deserve different treatment, lesser treatment. So our process then is to rehumanize, to recognize that that circle that, that, that uh, is drawn is, includes everyone bring in back into the circle with re-languaging, re-imaging, re-speaking, re-listening, so that all are included in that circle. And then the divinizing is what we've already talked about, you know, seeing the divine in all, including ourselves. That's the, that, I believe, is the key. <laughs> That's the work, right? If we keep going back to our second principle, we got this. <laughs> if we keep understanding at the deeper and deeper level of what it really means to have a spark of divinity in all human beings, that's the work, to recognize that again and again. And the second key, then, is to practice generosity. So generosity is understood as assuming the, the most, having the most generous assumptions about people's intentions and actions and words. So making generous assumptions, not jumping to conclusions and making up stories. You know, but check out the facts. <laughs> and in the meantime, have a very 
generous assumption about people. And even when it's not about a specific thing, just a general way of being. This is a way of saying that we don't show up judgmentally. You know, we show up in a way that has a generosity of you are a divine being. <laughs> and mistakes happen along the way, and that's okay. And we have that for ourselves too, and we are generous to ourselves. The next point is about leaning in and listening. This is how we cross some of that division, right? So we get closer to others with different perspectives, and we really lean in and listen. And one of those key phrases that we can use to call more of the connection is tell me more. Almost in every conversation that one works. <laughs> tell me more. If you truly want connection, that is, with the individual you're interacting with, tell me more calls that forth. And then you can find those connections at the deeper levels of what is shared. Just when you want to turn away from the conversation, if you're having a difficult conversation with somebody that has some edge, some conflict, some difference or contrast, it's just when we have that urge to turn around or to end the conversation that we need to check in and say, what if I ask them, tell me more? And so we have to discern, is this a time where I shake the dust off my sandals, so to speak, and move on? Or is it really that I'm just moving away because I'm uncomfortable? <laughs> And so kind of keeping our own feet to the fire, essentially. And so the next, the fourth key, and I chose seven keys because um, I like some of the Hebrew numerology and it's, it's really um, abundant through the Bible. And this a seven is about physical completion. And so, so much of our series is, just as our unity principles, are about practical spirituality, right? Practical spirituality includes this kind of understanding of how we make spirit known in the physical world, how we make spirit known in the social world. And so this is a, bit, a big part of our journey. So the fourth one is to break the silence. That's the speaking up. That's the being a, having the courage to be a silence breaker when silence needs to be broken. So when we feel that something isn't quite right, having the courage to break the silence or to speak truth to Hui, as we said earlier, is, um, is one of the keys. The next one is to, and it, it follows with that, is to say what's in your heart to say. You know, in Matthew 12, 34, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I love that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we are really in our hearts, in that place of love and compassion and kindness, then the mouth speaks the truth, right? And it can be still strong, it can still be direct, but it's out of the abundance of the heart. It's a different way of speaking. Somebody in my, con my former congregation gave me the greatest compliment she could have ever given. I said something about, well, I didn't want to just be a talking, he or yeah, talking head in that moment. She said, oh no. You could never be a talking head. You are only a talking heart. And I've never forgotten that because it's like, that's what I want to aspire to. So bless you. <laughs> the affirmation we used when we were working with this idea the week that we did uh, Speak Truth to Hui was, I speak the truth with spiritual authority and kindness. You want to say that together? I speak the truth with spiritual authority and kindness. So it reminds us to be civil, to be truthful and civil at the same time. And then the next key is to stand up for all, including the less privileged. The definition of privilege is that we have the option to opt out of injustice, to opt out of difficulty, to close the doors on something that other people don't have the option to opt out of because they're living in the wilderness every single day. <laughs> And so it's our opportunity to stand with them and to allow those changes to be made so that they too can live more freely, more easily, more equally, more included in the human family and the rights and privileges that the whole human family has. So having the courage to speak up and stand up for all people and for all animals again, all beings for the world, for nature. Finally, the last key is to hold hands with strangers. And this is the one that reminds us that we are one human family. And so when we show up 
for those collective moments of joy or those collective moments of pain, it reminds us of that. Oh, that's right. People are good. <laughs> that's right. These are my brothers and sisters who I just hadn't yet met. You know, so when we come with that kind of perspective, we are reminded again and again of our belonging. Joseph Campbell brings us back to oneness when he says the second law, the survival is the second law of life, and the first is oneness. And so if we keep remembering that first law of, love, of life is oneness, we come from oneness, we return to oneness. That's the journey. That's what allows us to stay the path. So I want to invite you into a prayer to close out with all of this to assimilate within us this long, brave journey that we've been on. And I invite you to let these words be the words of your own heart. I am strong. And I'm flexible. I'm open. I'm compassionate and receptive. I'm willing to take risks. I have the makings and the markings of a brave soul. All my inner spiritual work up until this point has prepared me for this moment. All the books I've read, the workshops I've attended, the classes I've gone to, the insights, the ahas, the broken relationships, the healed relationships, the breakthroughs and the breakdowns. Up until now, I have been prepared and I am prepared to move forward as a brave soul, and I'm needed, needed to show up fully in this world. The world needs me. I am ready to hold the banner of inclusivity. I am ready to turn the ship of hatred and anger and otherness toward the truth of love and oneness. And I know what it takes, that there will be times that I step into difficult places, into a wilderness of aloneness in order to find my true belonging. And I'm willing, I'm able, and I'm ready. Thank you, God. My back is strong. My heart is open. My soul is brave. Let's say that affirmation together. My back is strong, my heart is open, my soul is brave, and so it is.